today's topic. Oh, so first of all, who am I? Uh, you know, I've worked in the database space for like 22 years. I worked on all sorts of software products under the Oracle stack. Uh, my name is Sandesh. Uh, I've worked with real application clusters, data guard, enterprise manager. Uh, you, you can name something and whether it's pro C, whether it's languages, whether it's Apex, I worked on almost everything across the stack. I spent a lot of time working on high availability. And over the last three or four years, I've been actually starting to switch over to working on AI ops inside the autonomous database. So basically all the operational stuff, automating all the operational stuff inside the autonomous database. That's been my goal. Uh, and uh, using all sorts of technologies that we develop internally using machine learning, which is now exposed as part of the autonomous database to users. Uh, so, uh, you know, me, Heli, and a bunch of folks uh, are, are fans of uh, uh, trying to, you know, promote uh, this kind of technology, right? And how you can use, uh, you know, most of this uh, machine learning technology that's available to people that actually do not understand anything about machine learning. So two years ago, I'd have this presentation and people would be like scratching their heads trying to figure out, I don't understand most of this, right? But I was like, okay, you have to know this, you have to know this, you have to know this. But today, this technology has democratized itself to a point where it's no different than a SQL query and analytics and stuff like that. It's just another tool in your box. But you have to understand what this technology is and how do you use it, right? Machine learning is a cool term. It's sometimes hard to understand when to apply it to the right applications, but I'm hoping that this presentation gives you a basic conceptual understanding of what AutoML is and how Oracle and its products are actually there in this space. So that's what we're gonna do. So first thing is AutoML basically automates repetitive tasks. So if you're doing something repetitive and you're trying to figure out, oh, is this model correct? Am I trying to change some variables? I'm trying to figure out, you know, so the whole process of generating a model is, is, is pretty much trial and error, okay? You have to converge it. You have to look for a certain set of metrics. You have to look for, uh, you know, whether your scores are better, you're having a proper F1 score, are you looking for proper precision or recall? What are you looking for, right? And then it, it helps you develop models a lot more faster. It helps you converge things a lot more faster. You don't need any understanding of the algorithms. So an algorithm is just like, imagine you have a car, and you're just trying different tires on it and trying to drive and see which tire actually works better for you, right? And that's basically where it is. You don't understand what kind of tread each tire has. You know, is, it a, is it a specific winter tire or an all season tire? But you don't care about that. You just care about the driving experience. And that's why AutoML does not require you to have any understanding of the algorithms. And it's also a simplified drag and drop environment for data scientists. There are many people in the Oracle space that do not code and love like things like Apex or SQL Developer, where all the code gets, so these are called no-code environments, right? Or low-code environments, where you can just click and you just don't have to write any piece of code and it generates the entire application for you. And that's really, really cool for some people who just kind of, I wanna do this and I'm done. I don't wanna write code. So that's why AutoML comes in. And it also gives you a final model or it gives you a starting point from where one can fine tune the model. So we'll go into a little more details of what all this stuff is, but basically AutoML is a massive enabler for driving machine learning through your organization, okay? And without actually having to know the details. So let's go through a quick recap. I've presented some of these things before, but I thought it's good to have some background understanding, right? So four major categories of machine learning. Supervised are more like expert systems. The machine does exactly what the human asks it to do, and that's pretty much it. Semi-supervised is it looks at some of these patterns within the raw data, makes predictions, and then it tries to figure out, uh, you know, it, after taking some human input as to whether some of its decisions were right or not, it goes back and guesses those things and tries to improve the accuracy of the model. So it uses human input in order to converge its model. That's called semi-supervised machine learning. The third one is called unsupervised, where you basically just give the model raw amounts of data and the model can figure out patterns in this data without any kind of input from people. So it looks for, like you can give some data and look for fraud information. You can look for social security data. You can look for a certain kind of an attack vector. So it looks for patterns in the data that might make sense, but you might not understand or see it uh, based on the initial uh, observation that you have. That's why these machine learning algorithms are very good. And then there's reinforcement learning where you can take decisions based on past rewards for this type of action. So these are four broad categories of machine learning. Now, <coughs> excuse me. 
for any machine learning workflow, there are four things that you have to do. You have to have the project. So you have to know what the project is. You capture the data for that project and you have to clean it. The first two stages take the most amount of time in a project and should take the most amount of time in a project because most of the other stuff is either automatable or it can be done in a very, very quick iterated fashion. So when you're building a machine learning model, you converge very quickly on the model. And if the model doesn't give you the results, you quickly scratch it and start from a fresh model. So you don't spend time on a bad model. Let me put it that way. It's very easy to discard. So that's why it's like, it's like how you have a phone today, right? And you, you know, earlier when you had a camera, you could take like 36 pictures in a roll and then you're like, okay, I have, I need a new roll now. So I'd be very careful what pictures I would take. But today we have a smartphone with one terabyte storage in it. So I would take as many pictures as I can. And then I'm like, I'll delete the ones I don't need. And that's how machine learning projects work, right? When in doubt, run it, discard it, and so restart the process. And you keep converging into this thing. So it's like a performance tuning exercise that you keep doing. The third step is to extract features, identify extract features. Features are columns. So when you're running a, imagine writing a select query, how many columns should you have? You know, what kind of query plan will that drive? The same way, when you're trying to determine the efficiency of an algorithm, the more number of columns that you have from a piece of imported data, the longer the model takes to converge. So if you have a smaller number of columns, uh, that helps to drive the efficiency of the algorithm much, much better, okay? So that's what that is, is uh, you identify and extract features. Features are columns. The fourth one, which is basically you take a piece of training data and you can take this training data and you apply an algorithm to it. So in order for this algorithm to function efficiently, you have to tweak something called hyperparameters. So what hyperparameters are to an algorithm is what init.ora is to a database. So you have to change the parameters in order for the algorithm to be more effective and efficient in what it's doing. Now, once you have this, using the test and training data, you basically get a model. So this is the flow generically of how most machine learning models or, pro or projects work. <coughs> At that time, when, we, when I was presenting this about a year ago, there were massive advancements in ML. What happened in the last four years basically dwarfs the past 50 years of growth in this space. And everything like modeling and ML infrastructure will basically become standard, which nobody's gonna spend time training a model because the model can be trained automatically using all this auto ML infrastructure. But getting the right data to train matters. So that's going to determine whether you're gonna have a successful outcome or not, right? And models will actually get better with sparse data. What does that mean? I have a very small amount of data that's required to actually train the model. The model is gonna get really good with this. And most enterprise applications, they're already going to be using embedded ML. So this was like something I presented a year ago where I said auto ML will basically become standard, right? And what's the difference between ML and auto ML? Auto ML accelerates or automates the manual steps in a machine learning exercise of algorithmic selection, feature selection, tuning the models, and then evaluating which one is the appropriate model and then kind of going back in a circle with repeated training cycles to converge on a, on a good model that matches your scores. That's the basic difference between ML and AutoML. A lot of people, when they got into the machine learning space, they spent time training models. That job is disappearing away now because AutoML basically can do all these combinations in a, in a much more efficient fashion. But what, is, what does this mean? So why is this thing so popular? First of all, Clouds made compute very affordable. It's very easy. It's very accessible. And a bunch of APIs can be used now. Now you can call things using REST and you can spawn off a whole bunch of AutoML code. And we'll see examples of this. And then there's a lot of growth and availability in open source as well as commercial AutoML, right? Because people don't want to spend too much time training their models. They want this stuff to be automated. They want these things to reflect in near real time and deploy these things as quickly as possible using a CI CD mechanism. That's why AutoML is very popular. But a lot of people said, is this going to replace data scientists? It's not going to replace data scientists. It's just going to give people more time to engineer better predictive features and develop better data acquisition strategies and pipelines. It's going to make you a better data scientist. It's like how all the optimizer features that have come in the database have not obsoleted the DBA yet. This is not going to obsolete the data scientist, but there are certain parts of the process that are gone that no longer are required to be done because the AutoML framework is very good at doing it. 
The main things in an auto ML pipeline, by the way, this is a refresher of what I had presented earlier, but you know, it's, it's a good start to getting into what's new, right? So the four things that are main in an auto ML pipeline is the algorithmic selection, the adaptive sampling, which means how much adaptive sampling is like optimizer sampling, right? Like the optimizer does, you know, buying peaking, buying graduation to find out what's an optimal plan. The same way an auto ML pipeline also scans data to see what is an optimal plan or what is the proper algorithm and what features to select in order to converge quickly to the model and hyperparameter tuning. These are the aspects that form a auto ML pipeline. Now, Oracle released Oracle machine learning. We released this in 18C. 19C added a new more, a bunch of new algorithms. 21C added even more algorithms. And we also, within 19 to 21, we basically deployed this into the autonomous database cloud. So today you can, you can deploy models, you can create workspaces, you can manage these models, you can look for prediction details, uh, you can write all this stuff in notebooks. And there's more than 30 high performance parallelized in database machine learning algorithms that are present in the database itself. So I can write a simple piece of SQL and build a model without moving my data. One of the biggest problems is that people move the data, you know, like if I'm writing something in, Pan, uh, you know, using Pandas data frames and I'm writing something within, a, say, a scikit-learn, I have to read the data from a disk, load in memory, do some processing, write some data back to disk. And if I'm, if I'm doing this with multiple different kinds of databases, then I have to pull the data, I have to replicate the data in so many different places. The data movement is a huge factor in, in trying to build a machine learning model. Whereas if everything is inside an Oracle database, you can use the in-database machine learning models to quickly do what you want to do without actually having to rewrite or redeploy the whole thing. So that's one of the biggest advantages of using the in-database machine learning models. And there's all sorts of different user interfaces for this. So you have Apache Zeppelin for OML notebooks where you can actually do OML for SQL, OML for Pi, there's SQL Plus and SQL Developer, where you can do, again, OML for SQL, OML for Pi. And then there's R Studio, where you can do OML for R. And then if you're writing, uh, if, you're, if you're using a graphical user interface to build a model, you can use Oracle Data Miner, which is built into the SQL Developer framework. And you can directly connect this to the Oracle Autonomous Database. And you can perform all these exercises with, or you can do this on-prem using your own Oracle Database because all these most of these capabilities are already there. The only difference is if you do this on our cloud, you get the auto ML capabilities. And you also get the capabilities to be able to not require to set up anything because the entire end-to-end -end user framework, the model repository, all these things with integrated Zeppelin notebooks, all that is part of the autonomous cloud. If you do this on your own on-prem, there's a little more work to do to build this framework to connect to all the algorithms in the backend database, but it can be done using, like SQL developer, you can natively do it. But you know, if you want notebooks and all these other conveniences, you have to go to the autonomous database. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so we came out with this thing, which was machine learning notebooks in the autonomous database. This allowed data scientists to do all sorts of cool stuff. You can share version notebooks. You can use all the in-database algorithms and you can, prepare, score, and deploy solutions. Everything and everything that a data scientist requires to do was available inside the autonomous database. Now, all this is what happened in the last two years. And this is available today, okay? And these are all the algorithms that are available, the various kinds of classification. So this is a very interesting thing for a, for a person working on the data scientist space is can I, what are, what are your algorithms? What are the kind of things I can do with your framework? This is interesting. And we'll go through all what's the new stuff in 21C in the next couple of slides. But th these are the existing algorithms. Mainly I'm interested in classification, regression, clustering, anomaly detection, and time series. Uh, a lot of work has actually gone to the statistical functions as well as the feature extraction. So that's something that people have been working on for some time and people use it quite a bit. I, I was very surprised to see how many people use statistical functions when they're doing most of their stuff. So you don't even need to go into building ML models. You can write some, something as simple as statistical functions or feature extraction to do some basic attribute important stuff. So I've gone through most of these points, but a couple of things I want to mention. It had, with, with, with this inbuilt machine learning engine, we have the ability and, and pushing down 
and leveraging exadata storage to your function pushdowns. So if you have exadata, we can actually leverage that to do batch and real-time scoring at scale, right? And you can also do algorithmic specific automated data preparations. And the cool new thing is you can actually create and export import models across databases. You can back up models, you can build uh, audit user actions, you can set up access controls per model. All these have been developed over the last couple of months. So ML models are basically in our first class database objects. They can be treated as such. What are the new stuff in 21C? Now 21C came up with four major areas. Or, or three of them are, are mainly algorithmic areas. And the fourth one is better prediction details. Now this is not auto ML. This is core functionality inside the database itself, right? By the way, if you have questions as I go, please post them in the Q&A. So when we, when we get to the end of the presentation, I could start going through the Q&A and answering as many questions as I can. All right. So the first one is called XGBoost. XGBoost is not a new algorithm, okay? A lot of open source implementations make use of or build something called gradient boosted trees, which are actually very popular. Uh, it's a very popular category of algorithms, which, which do classification, regression, as well as ranking of uh, different models or you know, whatever that you're trying to build on. And it's very popular. It's an extremely powerful and time-tested algorithm. The only difference is in what, what we have is we've built something that is natively integrated into the database and can perform at scale. It runs extremely well. And it's implemented in such a way that it can operate on Oracle database data in a very efficient fashion. So that's what, that's what we've built into our XG Boost implementation. Many people were asking us, how come you don't support XG Boost? Because everybody who wants to do this uses gradient boosting. So that's there in 21C. The next one is something we developed called multivariate state estimation technique. It's a mouthful, but the main thing what it does is anomaly detection when trying to uh, produce minimal amount of false alarms. And it's very useful for sensor and IoT data. If you're looking for anomalies in sensor data, IoT data, you know, this actually, this algorithm tends to work very well and is far easier to train. And that's something we developed. The third one is also a popular, oh, this, I mean, this has been there, the, the Adam optimizer, uh, as well as the ReLU activation functions have been available in the public domain, but we've basically built it in such a way that it's computationally efficient, requires very little memory, and can operate on extremely large data sets uh, for uh, neural network functions. So the ReLU activation function is, is pretty cool because it's a, it's a linearized function. And basically, when you pass data right through it, if the data is greater, greater than a certain value input, it gives you that input, otherwise it returns a zero. And what that does is it allows you to train models a lot more faster. If you want to read, you can read, read uh, about ReLU activation functions. They're a very critical and important part of any neural network that you work with. And it allows you, if, if the ReLU activation function is designed well, then it enables model training to be significantly accelerated. So we've actually built some of these activation functions into, into the, the in-database uh, uh, algorithms that we integrated. The last one is enhanced prediction details. So what happens is it allows high quality understanding of factors that contribute to a prediction, which is called explainable machine learning. Right, and I'll talk a little bit about it as we go more deeper into our presentation. There are, this is actually an evolving space. There are multiple things. There's, some, there's something called machine learning transparency. Uh, uh, there, there's several different terms for this thing. But the idea is, <coughs> excuse me, whenever a machine learning model is, is, is giving you a certain output, sometimes, you can understand by looking at the output what the machine learning model was thinking when it was doing it. In other words, the output is obvious. Sometimes the output is not obvious. In other words, the machine learning model behaves like an opaque black box and it gives you something. Like for example, should I buy this stock? 
The answer is yes. But why? Why do you think it's yes? So there's no transparency at all in a black box environment. So it's, it's interesting how that works. And the, the, this, whole, this whole explainable AI is a, is a conversation and a talk in itself. But what we do is, we, whenever we are doing a prediction, we try to understand what these factors are and try to be able to explain why those decisions were made when contributing to a specific prediction. So this is kind of a move towards explainable AI. The same thing, we've added this facility for SVM, generalized linear models, neural networks, as well as k-means. So when you're doing exercises with these algorithms, you will see a better quality of understanding of these factors and explaining why these predictions were come to. So these are enhanced prediction details, which were missing in the previous versions. Any questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A. So a quick summary of all the stuff we discussed so far, right? We're not even into AutoML yet, but this is important to understand before you go into AutoML. First of all, do not move your data. It's easier to just keep the data in one place and run the algorithms on it. It's very fast, it's very efficient. <coughs> Excuse me. And you don't have to create duplicate copies of your data. Second, it's a, it's a collaborative democratized machine learning for data scientists and developers. So you, you basically don't, you don't have to be a guru to use this stuff. Anybody can use this stuff. This platform is designed so our developers can take advantage of it. It's multi-language. There's SQL, there's Python, there's so many, and there's no code user interfaces, right? So there's SQL developer, there's Apex, where you don't have to write any code. You can just click, 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 and make the application generate all the code for you. And, or you can use the AutoML UI, where there's basically no code involved at all. It does the whole thing for you. You can access this from a broader data lake perspective. External tables, Cloud SQL, there's so many different mechanisms through which you can access this. You can get data and model governance. What that is, is basically providing security models for development, deployment, this is proper lifecycle management for governance of the entire thing. <coughs> and by default, this is already present inside the autonomous database. So you get advantage of all of that. You get scaling, you get bridging the gaps between development and production. You get ML ops, which basically means you can deploy your model, you can use SQL, you can use REST, you can use something called queryable model repositories, and you can also support streamline creation of ML pipelines. What ML pipelines are, are if you, if you perform multi steps in a pipeline, right? So for example, I'm taking something, I'm training it, I'm performing dimensionality reduction on it, and then I'm running this through some kind of a ReLU function, then I'm applying a filter on it, but that's called a pipeline. When you build a pipeline, the data gets chunked into different sections to produce the result for you. And it's, it's very important to be able to run this whole thing through a single MLOps pipeline. And obviously we have the entire stack that allows you to do all this, right? So <coughs> these are all the features of what we have inside the autonomous database. Now let's go to the other part, right? More details. How does this work? What and where does AutoML come into all of this, right? Now, I know that we have the capability for R and Python. Now you might think, why do we why are we even supporting Python? And that's a that's a separate conversation for another slide. But the main thing is we provide the ability for algorithmic selection, feature selection, model tuning as well as we can perform model explainability for feature acting. And we can do this across R as well as across Python objects. I'll give you more examples as we go ahead. So, <coughs> excuse me. So here's an example of uh, a Python function uh, being called within the OML data frame function. So what we're doing is, we're basically building a linear regression model here. And we're basically taking the X and Y data. We're trying to do a fit. This is defined as a function called build underscore LM. This is an SK learn function. This is part of scikit. So from scikit, we're importing the linear model and we're running the linear regression algorithm through it. Now remember, this is defined as a function. 
What I'm doing here though is I'm indexing this by loading the data frame for Iris. The Iris data set is a very popular data set in the machine learning space. I'm loading the different kinds of species. And within the species, I'm trying to examine the petal width and the petal length and trying to do a linear regression plot for it. So what I'm doing is the first step loads the data, which is this one here. And then I'm invoking this parallel function, which applies this index function called to build LM, which is basically what I wrote here with parallel equal to two, and then I pull the items from it. So it automatically spawns off a process to run the Python function and brings the data back into the DB and shows interesting things. So I can do a join between a scikit-learn function in Python and a SQL data frame function inside the OML APIs. So I can use the best of both worlds. If the data sits outside the database, I can do something interesting with it using Python. If the data sits inside the database, but I want to extract it and do some in-memory processing, and I can put the data back into the DB, I can use a combination of this. And this is using third-party packages like scikit-learn. So this is the interesting, this is the meat of the presentation, right? Is the AutoML UI. Most of us don't know or don't care about this stuff. And we want to have the capability to be able to use this. So how do you do this, right? So when you go into the Oracle machine learning screens, I don't have enough time to demonstrate this whole thing, but I at least want to give you guys a concept of how this works. <coughs> Excuse me. So we go into the, the AutoML screens and there's four things here that you can see. There's feature ranking, there's algorithmic selection, there's adaptive sampling, feature selection, and hyperparameter tuning. All of these are automated steps that are conducted. It gives you automated insights based on the scores it has generated for each of these. It shows you which algorithms have been executing here. And you know, it tells you what their precisions and uh, you know, what their recalls are, as well as you can say, generate the F1 score or generate the RMSE score for any of these. And it, it basically automates this entire task. So you say, here's the data, here are the algorithms, find the best combination and you figure out which columns are interesting. So it will automatically do attribute importance, find the important columns, run against the algorithms and build different, 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 different models and tell me the scores of these models. So I can just run this, grab my coffee, have a sip, come back after a while and it's completed. And I can just say, oh, Based on this, this model looks good. I can click and deploy it. Now, once the model gets deployed, uh, you know, people using the model on the site will tell me whether it's, it's working good or not. Assume it's not working well. I can quickly deploy the older model and I can repeat this entire experiment again or I can go back and see why did this particular model not perform the way it was expected to perform. So the entire end-to-end -end step of creation, management, deployment, and if something goes wrong, undeploy and put the previous model in is completely automated using OML and auto, using the AutoML UI. So again, <coughs> these are the four major steps. The auto algorithm, it identifies what the in-database algorithms are, which are going to get the best quality. Then once it does that, it extracts the right sample of training data and it will adjust the sample for any kind of unbalanced, unbalanced data that it finds. Now, what does it mean by balanced or unbalanced? There are two kinds of data sets. Data sets that are too close to be true and then other data sets that are too way apart. So it's like, imagine you go to an examination and you get, a, you get the questions exactly what you had studied in the book. Another examination, you get, the, you get the questions that weren't even in the book. Either case is not good because it doesn't test your skills, right? The first case only tests your capability of memory understanding. The second one just tests your analytical capabilities. But, you know, I studied X, you gave me Y. <coughs> Excuse me. Not everybody is good at this. So it... In order to for the data to be somewhere in between, 
where it's more balanced, the adaptive sampling algorithm comes in. So the data is not too close to the right answer data set. And so it's it's not it's 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 not undercompensated or overcompensated. And that's what adaptive sampling takes care of. Now you don't have to understand any of this, but these are the various steps that the AutoML UI will perform for you. The auto feature selection does denoising of data. What does that mean? I have a table that has 50 columns. Do I need 50 columns for training my model? Maybe not. Do I need 20 columns? I don't know. Do I need five? Why don't you find out? What the model does is it performs a multi-step dimensionality reduction exercise where it goes through all these things. It keeps reducing the number of features. And it comes to a point where beyond a certain set of features, the, the entire algorithm falls apart. The quality of the model deteriorates completely. It knows that if I do this much, this is how well it works. If I go beyond this, it doesn't work well at all. So that's the aspect of denoising. And it will pick just the most relevant features that are required for me to predict. I'll give an example. I'm trying to sell insurance to people, right? The three most important things you want in a, in a person you're trying to sell insurance to. First, the person can consistently pay the insurance premium. So what do you need to know for that? Does the guy have a bank balance, right? A good bank balance. Second, has this person ever missed payments for credit cards and all of these things, right? So you have the money, but sometimes you may not pay. So are you paying consistently or not? And the third, you want people that never claim insurance ever because, <coughs> excuse me, these people will pay you the money, will never claim insurance. And it's gonna be a total profit for you. So there are lots of other things. Amount of distance I drive, which country I come from, how big my house is, how many cars do I have? How many people do I have in my family? Do I have a teenager at home that might drive? There are all these different features that the algorithm has to take into consideration and say, maybe I just need these three most important things. And that's more than enough for me to figure out if this thing is required or not. So that's called denoising and feature reduction by identifying the most predictive stuff. And this overall leap significantly improves the accuracy. Remember, the lesser number of features, the faster the model trains. Why? Lesser data. You know, if I have a SQL with 20 columns in it, it will take more time than a SQL with two columns in it, right? Especially if it's column organized, but <coughs> you get the idea. That's what, that's what auto feature selection is. For some reason, I have a pretty bad throat today. So I definitely need my, uh, my Java to go for this. All right, last, last aspect of it, which is the auto model tuning. Now this one keeps changing hyperparameters so that you don't have to do any of this stuff. You know, number of, in a, in a random forest, uh, configuration, it will automatically alter the number of forests that you to configure. Oh, if I'm doing a decision tree model, what should max be, what should min and max be set to? You know, all these things, it takes care of. It knows what the values are, which are good for this model. And based on the other models within the model repository, it is smart enough to understand what values will converge to a much more accurate data set. So these four things are very key and they are completely automated within the OML auto ML UI experimental pipeline. Now, you won't see any of this. You will just see those user interface screens that I had shown here. This is all you will see. It's simple. You will see it running and when it's finished, you will basically see the models, the appropriate scores, now, once I have this, okay, what other stuff can I do with this, right? And how does this compare against a manual 
pipeline that I have. Now, the comparisons that have been made here are, I've not compared the OML, AutoML UI against completely a third party thing. I'm comparing it against the OML for Pi variant, which can make use of a Python piece of code, which comes from another machine learning framework. So algorithmic selection, it can support, it's optional again. Adaptive sampling is usually on the roadmap for many people. In case of OML, AutoML UI, it's already there. Feature selection, again, it's optional. You know, Sometimes it's available, sometimes it's not available. Model tuning is usually available in both and model selection as well. The feature prediction impact can be done using something called MLX. So it's called a model uh, extension or model exchange framework, where you can actually pull in different functions or modules from other frameworks to be able to perform feature prediction. And then obviously you can generate the notebooks as well as deploy this thing to something called OML services. I'll talk about what OML services are in a bit, but this is a comparison between where you can have a full automated pipeline and you'll have a manual pipeline with some parts automated, some parts are not automated. And that's how you can compare both of them. So, you know, what a, the key with OML services, right, is it basically allows you to <coughs> do ML ops lifecycle management for your models, score models, you know, take something, deploy it. Uh, exchange models from one framework to another framework. Uh, I've done some training in TensorFlow and I want to export that TensorFlow model and bring it into the Oracle database. I've done some training in the Oracle database. I want to export that and take it into scikit-learn. You should be able to do model management and deployment services and take things around and shake things around. So ONX, right? ONX, ONNX is like a network exchange where there's a certain format that's defined for the models, how they can be stored. So in database, we store these things in our native format, but when we export these things, we convert them to Onyx so that not only we can take our models and give them to other uh, frameworks, we can take other models that are pre-trained from other frameworks and we can import them into the Oracle database as well. So all this is available as part of OML services. So import, store, compare models, and you can organize these models within the same namespace. So this is kind of like, so remember Onyx is just a way for people to share models across different kinds of frameworks. In this case, you have OML, you have TensorFlow, you have PyTorch, we have MXNet, as well as we have Scikit-Learn. Uh, MXNet is an Apache project, Scikit-Learn, comes from Scikit, PyTorch is its own, which came up from Facebook, TensorFlow is a Google thing, which is in Java. So they're all different frameworks. They implement things in very different ways, but they have a central way using the Onyx formats to exchange their models and how they're built. So that's what OML services provides for us. So one thing that was missing before is the ability to use REST APIs for everything. So we had the initial version of the Zeppelin notebooks where people could just go log in, uh, you know, put some stuff in there. But then, you know, after you're running through hundreds of models, you can't just keep clicking away, right? You need something that can run things in an iterative batch fashion. How do you do this? So first of all, you can use their REST endpoints, right? So you can store machine learning models. You can create scores for models that are already registered. You can check classification and regression of third-party Onyx models, including something that comes from scikit-learn, TensorFlow, and stuff like that. And you can also have proprietary cognitive text capabilities. So we have, I'm, I, and, and I've not managed to go through too much in depth in this presentation because AutoML does not focus on uh, cognitive text capabilities, but that's also one of the features that's available within the autonomous database. And there's image functionality which is also supported through Onyx format third-party model deployment features. So <coughs> you have the ability to score using images or tensors for image recognition. So all these capabilities are provided within OML, but the most important one is using REST endpoints for registration, storing, and classification of models. And that's something that was not there before. 
So you can either use different kinds of authentication methods. You can use username, passwords, you can use tokens, actions, and then you can use CRUD functions to directly access either the database or ONL services. Remember what I told you before, the, the PDB itself has the algorithms and the data. The OML services have the models where you can actually take models, exchange models, and, and, and you know, transfer them into each other's frameworks using Onyx. That's what the OML services provide. So that's why these two have been shown separately. And slash OML users is how you get to the PDB, slash OML mod is how you get to the OML services. I've just put a list here. I'm not going to read through all of this, but these are just the various kinds of components that you can call, right? There's generic functions, there's obviously current functions here, and there's admin functions, repository functions, deployment, as well as cognitive text functions. And there are ways to query all of these endpoints. So you can basically perform everything you can perform on the user interface on the notebook using simple ways like this. So you just have to type in that thing, deployment, whatever, the V1 deployment, the URI of the model, slash whatever is the score, <coughs> excuse me, and you can set the variable. So this is, this is like any other REST framework where you can send the value and it executes the results and it will send you back the JSON results. So I, I, I mean, I really love the fact that we have this today versus something that we did not have before. You know, earlier we did not have the capability to execute these things to rest. Now we have, and we can actually take this and deploy models at scale uh, without actually having to click and, you know, kind of do all these things manually like how we used to actually do this before. So this is using REST functions. There are different component deployment scenarios using AutoML. So first one is kind of like the straightforward one, right? You go to AutoML, you generate a notebook, it goes ahead and uses an, a built-in DB model, and you export this model to OML services. And then you can use in-database SQL scoring, and then you can deploy this into an Apex app. This is the simplest and the most common way that I anticipate users will actually use this and requires the least amount of work, the least amount of code. And if you want, you know, if you're the power user, you can always still do direct model access and you can still do in database scoring by directly accessing this without actually doing the stuff in the notebook. And you can also transfer this to analytics cloud. The second one is using just pure notebooks and not using any of the AutoML UI where you can either directly deploy the database model or you can do direct model access uh, for uh, in data scoring or you can import and export the model. So here what we are doing is we're not using the AutoML UI to do most of the work. I'm writing and deploying all the code. So this would be something that more experienced data scientists would use. We're directly using the, SQL, the OML notebooks. Now, <coughs> there's the multi-database option, which is kind of interesting where I've, I've deployed something in the autonomous database. I've trained my machine learning model. Now that I've used the AutoML UI and I've trained my model on ADW, I want to bring that to my on-premises database. So I, I don't want to train the model anymore. It's trained, it's done. I can export this model and I can bring it to an on-premises database and run this on the data in the on-premises database. I can actually do that. I can export and import an in-DB model and take it from autonomous to an on-premise and on-premise to autonomous. This is actually something I anticipate a lot of people will start doing. Because remember, you don't want to set up the autonomous stuff on the local databases. So you can use an autonomous database to do all the training and all the AutoML UI. And once your model is trained, you would just export and deploy it across your on-premise environment infrastructure. So this I see is a very common, this actually will become a very common multi-database deployment scenario uh, going forward. The last one is I can use the OCI data science repository. So OCI data science is not a service, right? I know, you know, I've not had time to cover it in this session, but I could take any open source package and I could write 
maintain the model, score it, deploy it, compare it, lifecycle manage it, onyx it, do all of this stuff inside the OCI data science. So how is that different from OML? OML focuses on database and database related algorithms. OCI data science is like an IaaS instance that allows you to do all of these functions separately. So there are two different services for two different categories of data scientists. So you can take the stuff from OCI data science, export this model in Onyx, import it back into OML services, and start writing an application in Apex that actually leverages this model. So this is another deployment scenario where someone starts from an open source model, complete open source model, and exports and imports it into the database, and then can start using it using Apex. So to summarize, AutoML is a very standard feature now as part of the autonomous database that simplifies the entire process of machine learning modeling and deployment. And it's it allows for ranking features, it allows for not thinking about the algorithms and you know how this thing is picked. And it basically picks a final model per algorithm. And it does all of this automation for you and iterating through various combinations of algorithms and hyperparameters and feature selections. And something in two years ago that would take you weeks to do can now be done within a couple of hours. Where the system basically, it depends, again, a couple of hours means depending on how large your data set is. Where data set is not large, this will finish in minutes. So uh, combine this with an exadata that can read a terabyte a second, you can just imagine how fast these things can actually be done. So this is something that's gonna be a very core feature in our, uh, if, you, if you're not learn any kind of machine learning, you, you need no prior experience to start using this. And this is available as part of the, the free uh, deployment for uh, autonomous database. I put a link to a whole bunch of resources uh, regarding videos, uh, you know, text, documentation, Apex workshops, live. So we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have this thing called Live Labs where you can actually click and you can follow and do these things. It's something that we're promoting a lot of lately because there's, there's a dedicated team that's actually managing and maintaining these Live Labs. So if you have a chance and you have not used this before, uh, consider trying, trying to utilize these Live Labs because I think they're pretty cool. They allow you to learn something uh, pretty well. Anyways, this is part of the presentation. So once you get this, you know you have the opportunity to click on every one of these links if you want more information.